Welcome to the Aaron Harbor Show. My guest today, Dr. Seth Berkeley, the leader of Gavi. Seth, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Well, tell me a little bit about Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So Gavi is a public-private partnership established in 2000, and the thesis behind it was there were new, powerful, life-saving vaccines that weren't getting to people who needed them the most, the poor living in the poorest countries. And so Gavi was born. It's been quite successful. It's now launched more than 350 different vaccines in these countries. We've immunized more than 700 million additional people and prevented more than 10 million deaths. The model's a little unique because everybody pays something. So if you're very poor, you pay a little bit. As you get wealthy, you pay more until eventually you transition out. And we work with companies to try to shape the market since we buy vaccines for 60% of the world's kids. We're able to bring new manufacturers in, but also to you know, create an environment that's a win-win for companies. How cooperative are the manufacturers? Well, it's interesting, you know, the, the vaccine manufacturers are, in general, the public health figures of pharmaceutical companies because vaccines are generally given by governments, so there's a monopsony, and um, in that case, they see it as a public health intervention, and so um, they really want to see their vaccines being used across the world. The challenge has been the differential in price and trying to make a way for that to be solved. How many vaccines do you deal with? We're dealing now with uh, more than a dozen, um, some of which are vaccines that every child on earth should have, for example, the pneumonia vaccine or vaccines against tetanus, but there are other vaccines that are regional vaccines like Japanese encephalitis in nine countries. And then we also do a, a, a series of, of stockpiles for vaccines for emergency outbreaks, for yellow fever, for meningitis, and more recently for Ebola. What are the challenges in stockpiling? Because certainly some vaccines uh, don't have uh, an infinite shelf life. So the interesting question is, and we've been having a discussion with the FDA and other regulatory agencies about this, is could you create a, um, a stockpile and keep it in bulk form? So that's not putting it in the individual vials because when you keep it in bulk, it actually keeps for a long time. It's when you put it in a vial that it only has a limited shelf life. So if you're constantly having to do that, it's expensive. If you leave it in bulk, the challenge is it takes a while to take it from the bulk into those vials because you have to do quality assurance tests and sterility and all kinds of other things. And so if there's a way to create a, a rapid way to uh, fill these, then you might be able to keep the bulk for a long time and not have to worry about uh, vaccines uh, becoming unusable. What's a long time? So 10, 15 years. Um, that is, that is, that's a long, I'm surprised to hear that. And I you heard. could make then large amounts of vaccines. You could make, you know, you could make 10 million doses. Once you produce vaccines, it's the, you know, the, the expensive part is not necessarily the production. It's all of the quality assurance, quality control, regulatory, because vaccines are living things. It's not like an aspirin. If you make an aspirin, you could make it in your garage and you could take a test. It's an aspirin or it's not an aspirin. The vaccine is a living thing, so you have to regulate every aspect of it to make sure you have a product that is going to be the same as what was used in the trial. So how would you store uh, 10 million doses uh, in bulk? Well, I mean, it depends upon how the vaccine gets stored. One of the challenges with the recent Ebola vaccine was it needs to be stored at minus 80 degrees. So that's a special, you know, care for it. Other vaccines, minus 20, um, this is centigrade, and then, and then some at, at two to eight degrees. Um, and, and they can be kept in, in large, you know, bottles, large um, uh, uh, containers for use later on. So in, in the process, I guess you could call it a manufacturing process, it's really just an injection process. You have the very small bottles for the individual injections. Uh, obviously, you have to put the vaccine into that. I would think if you had the bottles already, uh, I'm envisioning some conveyor belt type system that, that you could rapidly, relatively rapidly, uh, produce millions of doses. That, that is correct, and it is a conveyor belt system, and it obviously has to be completely sterile. You have to know that the materials the bottles are made of are the right material, but then there's a whole process to prove that it's sterile, to prove that the 
what's in the vial is what you started from, to look for contaminants, to make sure that it that meets all the safety. I mean, vaccines are very different than other things. When you're, when you're sick with a disease, people will tolerate some side effects. But, you know, here's a vaccine you're giving to healthy people, to babies. And so the level of standards are extremely high. And so that's what takes the time. So is the debate about the extent of, I assume you would do statistical sampling if you're making 10 million doses, you're not going to check every dose, but if you're checking, you know, you check times. lots and that's the way you do it is you kind of check the lots. But then when you fill and finish, you put them in vials, you have to check the vials to make sure what's in them is there. And then, of course, you have to understand how long those vials can last for and and make sure they're safe. Typically, how long can vials last compared to the It depends upon of- the vaccine. So it can be anywhere from one to two years to three or four years. Um, they tend to have a relatively limited, usually it's um, 18 months to two years kind of range, but it does vary by vaccine. All right. Well, that's still better than I thought. I thought it might, might be shorter. You mentioned Ebola. Where are we in terms of Ebola vaccines? I know there have been, uh, there's been some success. I know there are multiple efforts. Uh, tell me where we are. Well, it's an interesting story. Um, Ebola, um, the first uh, finding of Ebola was in 1976. There was a small outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, Since that time, there were 25 other outbreaks of Ebola, but each one was a couple of hundred cases or less. And it was only in 2004 that we had that explosive outbreak that ended up in the tens of thousands of cases and, and created all of the concern. The challenge was there was no market to develop a vaccine because this was a disease that was episodic and um, the, the disease was in very poor people, so there wasn't a, you know, a financial incentive to do that. What happened was when the original, um, after 9-11, when there were anthrax outbreaks in the U.S., there was a, an attempt to try to scale up bioterrorism work, and for a while they had Ebola on that bioterrorism list. So some work was done at that point, and those are the vaccines that came out of the freezer and began to get fast-tracked during the um, 2014 Ebola outbreak. So at the end of that outbreak um, in Guinea, um, a vaccine was tested, um, a vaccine that Merck um, was working on, and it had 100% efficacy in a modest-sized trial. And so that's the vaccine that we've been working with. And, you know, we, uh, we were talking previously about vaccines in general. Just out of curiosity, I know I, we have to go to a break, but uh, how many vaccines has there been tested in terms of how many vaccines can a person handle at once? Is, well, there, any, is there any limit? I love, I love when parents ask me this question because, to me, the immune system is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the better it is. I mean, children were meant to crawl, hopefully not in the Bombay sewers, but they were meant to crawl and eat things. And as they do that, their immune system gets stronger and stronger. So there is no limit to the number of vaccines that you can have. The more you have, the stronger your immune system is. All right, so I shouldn't be sanitizing everything I see if I have a munchkin. Quite the opposite. All right, fair enough. We're going to be right back with Seth in just a moment. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. The Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who, through leadership, skill, and dedication, is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbor. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political, and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbor Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. 
Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at harbortv.com. Welcome back to the show. I'm with Dr. Seth Berkeley, the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. So, Seth, how do we do a better job of controlling outbreaks in the first place? Well, th there's two answers to that. First of all, from the vaccine side, if you have a vaccine for a disease, you vaccinate the population, you don't have any outbreaks. So for things like yellow fever, we keep a stockpile when there is an outbreak, but the best thing to do is to just get vaccine out to the general population. Um, the other thing that's really important is every country, every group in the world needs to have the capability to uh, investigate and manage an outbreak. And, 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 and it's, not, it's, it's not rocket science. What you need is a small group of people. When you hear that there's something funny happening, you need a group that can go out to that community Ask the questions, what's happening? Take some samples. If the national lab isn't good enough, you can send it to a reference lab. And then once you know there's an outbreak, you need a team that can go in and work because local is critical here. If you, know, you have people from outside that don't speak the local language, they will not be able to work with the community. So that's what preparation is, is like. Now, if you ask the question, what percent of the world is, um, is fully prepared, the answer is quite low. And, and um, we see now more and more outbreaks occurring. We're seeing, you know, because of, of, of increase in population, because of, of uh, change in temperatures, because of people um, imposing on rainforests, because of urbanization and, and having people together, we're going to see more and more outbreaks. It's evolutionary certain. So globally, what we need is to have this view that we need to be prepared to have the people in place, but then to use the tools we have effectively. Is there any threat of some kind of super bug that could really be devastating in terms of millions of people population wise. Tell me about that. Absolutely. So, I mean, let, let me go through that in two different ways. So first of all, the thing that's most scary of the known agents, the unknown is always unknown, but of is, is flu. And we're just over the 100th year anniversary of the Spanish flu, which killed 50 to 100 million people. Now, that was before the era where I would often, you know, have, um, you know, dinner in Nairobi, breakfast in London, and lunch in New York within the incubation period of disease. So you have one billion people moving out of their countries. So, you know, that's a disease that you really, you know, would have to be scared of that, you know, could have an effect going forward. But we also have now antimicrobial resistance. We used to think, gee, we have these antibiotics, no big deal to get an infection. But we just had an outbreak in, in, um, in Pakistan, typhoid, very common disease, used to have typhoid Mary, you probably heard of, 20% mortality pre-antibiotics. Now with antibiotics, less than 1%. They've just had an extreme drug-resistant outbreak that's resistant to five of the six known antibiotics. One of the cases actually ended up getting um, traveled to the UK, so they had to deal with it there. If that sixth antibiotic isn't working, then you end up with a you know, a super bug that can infect people and cause terrible disease. So this antimicrobial resistance is a big problem. So how do we harden uh, defenses against uh, a global outbreak? And, and what can individuals do in terms of uh, being healthier so their own resistance is greater? Well, first of all, for the individual, obviously, get your vaccines. You'd expect me to say that. But then also, don't take antibiotics unless you need them. I mean, a lot of the antibiotic use is done in animals, and that's a problem because you can get resistance transmitted. But, you know, somebody says, I got the flu. What they mean is, I've got a little bit of a cold. I got a runny nose. And, and you know, taking antibiotics only messes up your biome. It doesn't help, in, in, if anything, and in fact, um, you know, increases the risks of side effects. So, um, and, and the last thing that's important is, is, is making sure you're paying attention to unusual signs or symptoms or things that could happen because we in essence need everybody to be paying attention to potential outbreaks. What about, uh, tell me your concern, I assume you have some concern, there's been for a number of years a, an anti-vaccine movement uh, in the United States where certain groups claim that vaccines will give children autism or if you're pregnant and you get vaccinated. Talk a little bit about that and, and where we are with that, how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, it really is a tragedy because no parent wants their child to be sick or die. What's happened is, is that these diseases used to be real. 
Now, my wife is a, you know, an academic medical doctor. She ran the intensive care unit at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. She's never seen a case of measles or of tetanus or any of these diseases. And that's what's happened. With that, you have a complacency. And a mom who says, look, I love my child. I'm worried about the side effects. I'm not worried about these diseases anymore. But of course, if you get these diseases, most of the times the, the baby may be okay, but every once in a while there'll be horrible side effects. Now, in our countries, we still see the diseases, so parents do want to get vaccines. But as the, this false information spreads, the challenge is when you go on the Internet, you don't know what's good advice and what's bad advice. And so the real danger there is that parents will, you know, look, see, oh, my God, these vaccines are dangerous and won't get them when they are life-saving. Are the resources available to, to deal with outbreaks, to, to deal with the kind of devastation which could occur? Or is there a gap between funding, whether it be on a global basis or a country by country basis, and the resources really needed to respond uh, to these uh, actual and potential situations? So it's funny, I did a TED talk on this, and, and one of the, high, uh, the, 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 the ways I articulated that question is if you look at our nuclear deterrents, so there are land-based missiles, there are, you know, sea-based missiles and, and uh, sorry, air-based missiles, um, land-based missiles, and then there's submarines. And we spend $40 billion in a biennium keeping these submarines under the oceans at all times. The likelihood that the first two legs are going to fail is pretty low, but we invest that to kind of protect the world. The, the budget for WHO, which is kind of the world agency for this, is a, the world, is a health organization. world Health Organization, is a few hundred million dollars during the same period. So if you ask globally, are we spending what we need to, the answer is absolutely not. What's the gap? What should we be, what well, are we spending? What should we be spending? It's hard to put an exact number on it, but it is an order of magnitude uh, where it should be, uh, both in terms of the numbers, but more important than the total spend is this notion of every single country needs to be prepared. So I just came back from the Democratic Republic of Congo where we did the first Ebola vaccine. There are parts of that country that do not have good health workers, do not have good health systems. And that's what has to be built so that everywhere you have an early warning system and then the ability to go and, and work on that. And, and we know evolutionarily we're going to have more outbreaks. So the challenge then is if we know that, why aren't we preparing for them? How about uh, status globally of HIV, and, and what's the, what kind of progress are we making there? So HIV, when I trained as a doctor, had just appeared. I saw some of the first few cases, and it started out as a death sentence. And I think you know the magic that has occurred in, in antiretroviral anti drugs. So now there's a whole you know, set of families of drugs that can be used to treat this. So it can be a chronic disease. The challenge is, one, we've already talked about, there is beginning to be more resistance to these, and that's a worrisome thing. But also, there's complacency. And so people are saying, well, it's not as bad, it's not a death sentence. And we've seen a flattening out of number of new infections. So it was going down, 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 and now it's kind of flat, which means it's continuing to be a problem. And not everybody who needs to be on treatment is on treatment around the world. And so it is still a major, major all right, we're going to take our last break. We'll be right back with Seth to wrap up. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. Hi, I'm Aaron Harbor, host of The Aaron Harbor Show. Because I've never done endorsements or commercials, people ask how are our programs funded, especially because we provide them as a public service to all our broadcast outlets. It's expensive to produce our show, whether we do them here in Denver or go to places such as Aspen, Washington, D.C., or even Iraq. The answer is we depend on contributions to support our work to bring you some of the nation's top opinion leaders. Individuals, businesses, foundations, and other nonprofits make tax-deductible contributions to the Democracy and Media Education Foundation to help allow us to continue to work for you. To find out more or to make a donation, just go to dmefd.org. The DMEF is a tax-exempt public charitable organization and has promised to dedicate 100% of every contribution to support our public affairs initiatives. If you believe, as I do, in the need for a forum which promotes civil discourse and mutually respectful discussion, I hope you'll decide to make a contribution today. 
I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. You can follow the show on Twitter for instant notification of new episodes, live event invitations, outtakes, and behind the scene photos. And tweet us your topic and guest suggestions today. Join me and watch The Aaron Harbour Show. 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 I'm Reverend Jesse Jackson. Watch The Aaron Harbour Show and Cheap Hope Alive. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. Find us on Facebook to get all the latest updates, see behind the scene photos, and make comments and ask me questions. You can see episodes before their TV broadcast, so like the show today. I'm Aaron Harbour, host of The Aaron Harbour Show. I very much would like to hear from you about the program, so please send me an email with your thoughts. You can suggest what topics I should cover, what guests I should invite to be on the show, or even what specific questions you would like me to ask. This is your program, so send your suggestions to Aaron at HarborTV.com. I promise to personally read every one, so email me today. And most of all, thanks for watching. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at HarborTV.com. Welcome back to the show. This is our final segment with Seth Berkeley. So Seth, one of the things I'd be really interested in, in, in your career and where we are today, how has our scientific ability to analyze vaccines, to decode them, to find, uh, and, and diseases, and to find solutions to them, how has that changed? Uh, and w what do you see ahead in the future that's gonna make things even easier? That's a great question, and it's really interesting because when I was a, a young doctor, people said, infectious You're still a young doctor. <laughs> infectious diseases, finished, done. We conquered those. There's no problem. But as we've already talked about, evolutionarily, we're going to continue to see those diseases appear. But what's really interesting is our understanding of infectious diseases is so limited. So when you go and look at the textbooks, you know, you, you see 150, 200, you know, bacteria, viruses they talk about, those are all the ones that make you sick. No surprise. Those are the ones that people studied, like typhoid we talked about, or HIV or others. But it turns out that, you know, nine out of ten times of the amount of DNA in your body is from bacteria and viruses and others that are part of your biome, and we don't know anything about those. And so what's really interesting is we first of all begun to learn that infectious diseases have antecedents for many other diseases. So for example, we vaccinated against two different cancers now, against liver cancer with hepatitis B and against cervical cancer and head and neck cancer with HPV. There will be more cancers that will have an infectious antecedent. But now that we're beginning to see the biome, there's all kinds of uh, interactions between external infectious disease and, and the host. And so, in a sense, we, we started out saying, oh, it was all finished, and now we're back at our infancy in trying to understand what's happening with that. So what do you think will happen? Just, I'd be interested technologically in terms of uh, our ability to understand a disease. Uh, how, to what extent will that speed our ability to create vaccines? And also, what kind of understanding do we have of how, uh, I'll just use the word smart, certain diseases are? I mean, because certainly there's some diseases that are constantly figuring out ways to outfox us. Yes. So uh, it's interesting. So sometimes, uh, you know, people have hypotheses and people don't believe them. So one of the famous cases is stomach ulcers and stomach cancer is actually caused by a bacteria. The guy who figured that out, nobody believed it. He ended up taking it himself and proving that, and he ended up getting the Nobel Prize for discovering Helicobacter pylori, which was the bacteria that caused those stomach ulcers. Right, so after years of everybody in the scientific community really more than just disputing him, but uh, almost embarrassing him. And, and there'll be other cases. I mean, I, I believe that we will ultimately find that some of the chronic um, bowel diseases and, and, you know, maybe some of the acute, like when you get type 1 diabetes, all of a sudden you end up with, uh, you know, getting it. There may be an infectious cause. We don't know that. We haven't discovered it yet. But as I said, we're somewhat in our infancy in be, being able to understand that. The challenge for vaccine development, though, is we have more and more tools in our armamentarium. We're not like Louis the Pasteur and, you know, the simple thing things that he did to try to develop vaccines. But some of the diseases are more clever. So HIV, if you look at flu, which varies, if this is flu, this is the amount of flu variants in a year, HIV is like this. 
And so when you get infected with one HIV strain, after a year, you have hundreds of billions of different strains. And that's been the challenge of trying to make a vaccine against that. So we are having to learn and work and change the way we make vaccines to deal with some of these big challenges. Why do we have such a problem in the United States with MRSA, uh, with infections in hospital, uh, in hospitals? Uh, uh, I mean, you hear so, uh, of so many cases of people dying of sepsis and things like that. What, what can we do uh, to address that challenge? Well, part of it is, is overuse of antibiotics we talked about, but again, this understanding of disease. So again, when I was a young doctor, we, you know, the idea was let's get the hospital sterile, let's keep the windows closed, let's use antiseptics everywhere. And what we learned, which is fascinating, is that if you remove all the healthy bacteria, then when bacteria does grow, and it always does, unhealthy bacteria grows in those environments. So it turns out that those not pristine and perfectly antibacterial you know, surfaces had healthy bacteria that competed if bad bacteria got there and might not get settled. So this whole concept of biome extends to uh, the physical environment and this is gonna be something that's gonna be you know, the science of the next generation. So instead of using Lysol, I should be just throwing a little dirt around my hospital room? There is a fascinating new study I just, I just read about Turns out that babies' guts, the, the mother's milk, has um, these uh, oleosaccharides that nobody knew. The baby can't digest. What is it for? Well, it's for a certain type of bacteria that babies had in their guts. They don't have them anymore. And the hypothesis is that maybe that is why you're getting all of these allergies, because you don't have the normal flora. So this is all early days. I wouldn't you know, rest my laurels on that particular finding. But right now, we're beginning to treat diseases by giving people healthy bacteria. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. Do you envision a time, or does this even make sense, where we would do genetic engineering uh, to make sure a person uh, is resistant to certain diseases. I mean, will, will Mons Monsanto does it with tomatoes? Will Monsanto be doing it with people? <laughs> it's more complicated. You know, early days in HIV, there was a case of a person that had a certain type of abnormality that the, that the virus couldn't attach to, and there was an attempt to try to reproduce that in others before there was good treatment. It's, it's pretty hard stuff to do, but I suspect these are things that will be considered in the future. Do you foresee uh, our being able to develop a universal flu vaccine, or is flu just too complicated for that? No, I, I believe science will prevail in that case. What, what's interesting, and this came out of the knowledge on HIV, is that even though you have the billions of strains I told you about, it turns out that there are some surfaces, some parts of the virus that have to be there to attach. And so you have conserved areas. And if you can target your immune response to those, so we have broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV, they also exist against flu. So we know there are some parts of the flu virus that um, are consistent. And if we can figure out how to target the vaccine to those parts, we could create a universal flu vaccine. What, in, in your opinion, what are the advantages to nano vaccines? Well, I mean, it depends how you're defining nano vaccines. So nanotechnology is a way of working, and sometimes that is a way to take um, a complex um, organism and break it down into its parts and use the subparts as vaccines. That's generally what's talked about. But nanotechnology also allows new innovative ways of working. So for example, we would like to not have to do injections. We would love to have patch technologies that exist today where you use micro needles as a way to deliver it. And these vaccines can be freeze-dried so they can stay outside of the cold chain. So we're going to see, I think, over time, you know, in an ideal world, a situation where you can self-administer vaccines. You, know, you get a little patch and you put it on for a period of time and that's your vaccine. I like that approach. Uh, of course, I mean, nowadays too, the way they, there are ways of injecting vaccines that you don't feel a thing. Uh, why are we even using needles today? Well, I mean, again, it has to do with the complexity of the body. You have a, the biggest organ in the body is actually your skin. And that skin is to protect you against bacteria and viruses and other things. So if you want to introduce something that's going to get to the immune system, you need to break through that system. And some of it can be oral, some of it can be inhaled. But um, in general, the way we did it was to inject it. All right. Seth, thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely to chat with you. That was Dr. Seth Berkeley. I'm Aaron Harbour. Thanks for watching.
Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.